Hello, and welcome to our podcast on critical lenses of literature. Basically, one text, many ways of seeing it. These mental constructs are interesting ways to focus our attention on various parts of a text, and when we focus on various parts of the text, then different themes or lessons are oftentimes revealed from those texts by how we focus our attention on this rather than that. It's not really a complicated idea, but it may take a little bit of explaining. So let's go ahead and see what we're talking about. So first off, what are critical lenses? They are the different perspectives we use to understand and interpret texts. And so we're not all going to read the same book in the same way. We are older or younger. We are richer or poorer. We are native language speakers. We are people learning the language. We have all kinds of different pieces of background knowledge that we bring to the text. And so these mental overlays help us to focus our attention on various parts of a text, which we may or may not naturally do, because we're going to read the text how we experience the world. But in literature class, sometimes we ask you to shift your focus a little bit and see it from a different perspective and see it from a different way. And so giving these lenses names and then practicing with reading texts through them allows us to sometimes just see more because different parts are highlighted in different lenses. And as always, as we are trying to read literature, we are trying to look for theme. Like, What are we supposed to learn from this text? What are we supposed to get as human beings from these fictional characters? And the different lenses we apply can help us see different things and therefore potentially deduce or learn other themes. So here's the list of lenses that we will be using this year. There are many more of these, and if you really like this idea and really want to focus on this and try more of them, you can certainly know more. Just look up any list of critical lenses, or of course you can major in English. That will really help you get into some of the more deep or confusing lenses. But for our class, we'll be looking through the formalist, historical, Marxist, feminist, and then the reader response lens. So while we just listed off five lenses that we will teach you to use and ask you to use and apply throughout mostly the second semester, these lenses do overlap. They aren't like silos, where if I look under the historical lens, I will only see A, B, and C. But if I shift my focus and look through the feminist lens, then I will only see one, two, or three. No, imagine a multi-circled Venn diagram where all of these five are overlapping, and that is what these lenses will offer us. Yes, each one asks us to focus on a specific set of ideas in a text, but there's probably going to be overlaps with other foci from each lens. Quick example, the historical lens asks us to look at this text in its historical context when it was written, what is it really being written about, what historical overlaps are there. So maybe it's a text written about kings and queens. Well, kings and queens have power, so that's going to bring in the Marxist lens, which looks at who has power in a society or in a text and who doesn't. That's also going to overlap a bit with the feminist lens, which looks at gender roles. Why do we have more kings than queens? As you're going through this, we're not looking at each one as an end-all, be-all, standalone silo. There's definitely a lot of overlap in all of them. So why do we look at these lenses? Why do they matter? Well, if we can focus our reading attention on different parts, we can see different things from the text. It's all the same written word in each copy of Of Mice and Men or To Kill a Mockingbird. But if we can subtly change our focus, different things might be brought into attention for us. And if we see different elements that we didn't just naturally see, perhaps we can learn a slightly different lesson from that same book. This is a great mental exercise for our brains and a great challenge for readers in moving past just the plot level of a text. So as you're getting better and better of following the who, what, where, when, and why of any text, challenge yourself. Place one of these lenses on overlay. See what is highlighted. See what pokes out, what is different, and therefore what new information you have that you might be able to learn from. So the steps. How do I use these lenses? What do I actually do? 
Well, number one is what this podcast is going to help you with. Know and understand the various lenses. Number two, know the topics that each focuses on. So understand that the historical lens asks you to focus on these things. The Marxist lens asks you to focus on these things. Really understand what each one is talking about. Then, as you are reading, commit to yourself, not to anybody else, not to me, not to another teacher, but to yourself that you're going to read actively. You're not just going to let the words wash over you. You're actually going to engage in this text and have a conversation with it. I know it can't physically answer back, but you're going to ask questions of it. You're going to think. You're going to deduce, comprehend, connect, all those great action verbs. And so as you apply these lenses, look for the details that pop from those lenses and commit to reading actively and then connecting the dots from there. So one way to think about these lenses is to think about actual lenses. Think about any pair of sunglasses that has interchangeable lenses. Here's an example just from the Oakley website. Here's an example of a pair of sunglasses that has interchangeable lenses. And we see 16 different pairs of various shades, colors, tints, amount of tint, all kinds of things. And each one of these is specially formulated for different conditions. So if it's an especially overcast day, perhaps using the bronze polarized would actually bring out more more highlights in the landscape. If it's an especially bright day, getting reflection off of snow or bright white pavement, perhaps the black iridium lenses would be better. Regardless of which lenses you are looking through, you're going to see the same landscape. But different lenses, when applied to different lighting conditions or weather conditions, might highlight certain parts of that landscape. And that's what these critical literary lenses are also going to do for us. So quick exercise, what do you naturally see here? Do you see the black vase outline? Do you look at the white part and see two faces looking at each other? Either way, whatever you see first, we're all looking at the same image. But if you focus your attention slightly, you're going to see a vase or you'll see faces. Another quick exercise, what do you see here? All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at each one in specific, formalist, historical, Marxist, feminist, and reader response. So the first one is the formalist lens. This is going to look at the text as a text. So meaning or learning through theme is discovered through close reading. We're not going to bring in our background knowledge on power structures or gender structures or anything else. We're going to use the four corners of the text to really help the text reveal itself. So what does that mean? We're going to use that text as a standalone document. We're going to stay within the four corners of that text. And we're going to examine literary terms. All those great things that you've studied through middle and high school. When does the author use a simile, metaphor, an allusion, a pun, juxtaposition, different types of irony, perhaps archetypes? Those are things contained within the text. How does the author use them? When do they use them? And what can those literary devices teach us as a theme? That's using the formalist lens. And this is typically what we do in our first semester of this class. We really stay within the bounds of the text, trying to see what the text can offer us and what it can teach us, just kind of at a direct read. So let's take a second and apply that. What if our text was The Lion King, the Disney movie from the 90s? Well, we might examine that the whole story does follow the typical hero's journey. But are there any unusual parts? Are there any steps that are skipped? What might that teach us? We might notice that Simba is a dynamic character, one of our literary terms. What does his change teach us? And similarly, Scar is a static character. What does his lack of change teach us? And perhaps we would notice that there's strong juxtaposition between the lions and the hyenas in this text. Juxtaposition being a literary term. Well, what does that symbolize? And then what does that teach us? So again, we're only examining the four corners of the text. The next lens we might use is the historical lens. We're going to look at a text through its connections to history. So for example, The Crucible, which was actually written in the 1950s about the Salem witch trials, is really about the Cold War of the 1950s. So a story written in the 50s, actually about the 50s, but they use a historical reference to help craft that. Of Mice and Men was written in the Great Depression about the Great Depression. 
how does that historical connection help illuminate a lesson for us as we read? And so if we're looking through that historical lens, we're going to focus on the social, political, and economic climate of the event being covered, but also the content of when the text was created. So how do we look through that lens? We're going to examine how might the author's culture, time, or experience influence their writing. So if so-and-so was writing in the 1950s, and this was a time of great conservatism or a great fear of communism, how might those have shaped this author's portrayal in his or her story? Number two, what does this text say about the author's life? So again, kind of the historical context of when it was written. But then also, what does the text say about social, economic, and political subject in the text? So perhaps it's a book written in 2018 about the Constitutional Convention. What does this teach us about history now and history at the original time? So again, quick application, look at The Lion King again. If we're looking at historical elements of this, well, how successful have monarchies traditionally been? This is The Lion King, so this is some sort of hereditary monarchy where power is passed from father to son, etc., etc. Well, let's connect it to monarchies in general. Maybe number two, how does this story relate to dictators? Scar comes in, he seizes power, and he rules as a dictator. Is The Lion King saying something greater about all dictators? Next lens to look through is the Marxist lens. Yes, this is named after Karl Marx, the communist writer of the early 20th century. But the idea is that the Marxist lens looks at a text in terms of power. And oftentimes, power is related to money. So some questions it tends to focus on are, who has money, who doesn't? Who has power and who doesn't? And then who is quote unquote rich? And then who is poor? Because being rich or poor doesn't always have to connect to money. It could just be rich in character or poor in character, meaning kind of a bad person. But they tend to relate. And so we look at power, money, who has it, who doesn't. So where do we focus our attention when we're looking through that Marxist lens? Well, let's look at the social class of the author. Where is that person writing from? Was that author poor themselves? Might that shape their world and then shape how they write about it? Let's also look at the text and how does it show people of different classes? Does it praise the upper 1%? Is it critical of them? Does it praise the poor and those who are destitute and struggling? Or does it point a finger and say, eh, they may need to make better choices? And so how do these power dynamics relate to class and money, both within the text, but also as coming from the author themselves? So again, quick application back to The Lion King. Ask ourselves, how do characters come to power? Hereditary? Or are they seizing power, as in Scar's case? And then how do those in power treat others? Do they lead peacefully? Do they lead in a positive manner? Or are they jerks? How do those who are not in power react? Is the class structure maintained or challenged? And ultimately, what can we learn from examining the power relationships in this text? Next lens is the feminist lens. And so yes, it does say feminist in there and the root seems to be female, but this is not only talking about women in this particular lens. So basically we're looking at a text through how gender and sexuality are shown. So we are going to look at stereotypical gender roles and how those are portrayed in a text. Are they in a positive fashion? Are they questioned? Are they challenged? Do characters seek to break out of the box of something stereotypical? And we're also going to examine LGBTQIA plus roles when using this lens. Do we have characters who are gay, who are transitioning, who are questioning? How do those characters work within a text? How do other characters react to those characters? Those are all elements of that feminist lens. And so how do we look through that? We're going to focus on the gender or orientation of the author. Might a gay author see the world differently than someone who is not? And might that person choose to write a certain way? How does the text itself treat gender roles or identities? Does a character affirm or reject sexist ideas? Does the text affirm or reject heteronormativity, which is the notion that in our society, heterosexuality is seen as the norm. But that's not necessarily the case for all. Some characters may be same-sex couples. Some characters may be questioning their own orientation. Does the text applaud that? 
Does the text shun that? Does the text help that character? Does the text push that character back into the shadows kind of stuff? And finally, does the text affirm or reject the idea of the patriarchy? The idea that society is dominated by man. Do we have characters who just say, well, that's the way it is in a very traditional way? Do we have characters who question that? What happens when characters question that? Are they celebrated? Are they punished? Etc. So again, quick application with the Lion King. Are all the characters heterosexual? Doesn't really come out in a quick read of this text, but maybe if we think about it, are they? What roles do men and women play in this text? And then what can we learn by looking at the gender roles and orientations of characters and how they're treated? That's the feminist lens. And then finally, the reader response lens. This basically looks at how the reader responds to the text. Individual meaning is derived as the reader reads. This is probably one of the easier lenses to really use. And so we don't actually study this, but a lot of our questions in class follow this lens. We ask you, well, what did you get out of it? Did you like it? What was hard for you? And so as we all are different people, we're coming from different backgrounds and places and ages and all kinds of different things, each book is going to speak to us in a very individualized way. And so when we really focus on how we connect or don't connect with a text, that's reader response. And so to use that reader response lens, how does the literature connect to the reader? What does it mean to the reader? It's going to mean something different to me than it does for you. We're, we're different people. We have different histories, different ages, all kinds of differences. And so we come with different sets of background knowledge that helps us either enjoy or not enjoy or truly understand or kind of just superficially get a certain text. And that's the reader response lens. So in short, how do we do it? We just read and we ask ourselves, do I like it? Do I not? Do I care for this? We'd of course love for you to love every single text we give you, but we know you're not always going to. There's all kinds of factors that encourage you to love it or things that really get in the way of you enjoying texts that we give you. And that's you looking through your own reader response lens. And so real quick, Lion King again, uh, did you like it? Does it remind you of any other stories? Do you prefer this to Cinderella? Why, why not? Would you recommend this to another person? Well, how old? How does it speak to you? Would you watch it again? Would you read it again? Any of those things that are very personal in orientation, those are going to be reader response lens focus. So that's pretty much it. Critical lenses of literature. There's going to be times throughout the year where we're all reading the same book or short story or a piece of poetry or listening to a song or a musical. We're all going to hear the same music and read the same words or see the same illustrations. But if we can place these layers of lenses over them and ask ourselves to think about different elements, those different elements of power, of gender, of historical relevancy will pop out and we will see different things. And then we can always do that deep diving work to figure out, well, what am I supposed to learn from this? Why does it matter? And that's what literature is all about. What can I learn as a human being from this text? And these lenses will help you focus on different elements throughout the year. As always, thanks so much for listening. If you have any questions, bring those into class and we'll get those answered as best we can. Thanks, and we'll see you soon.